<clears throat> Hi, my name is Mary Dewar. I'm a speech language pathologist, and I am here to talk to you about improving safety and comfort with eating and drinking at home. Um, this is a webinar that is geared towards um, parents and caregivers for individuals that have feeding and swallowing difficulties, um, also known as uh, pediatric feeding disorders or dysphagia. Um, and we will move along. Oh, okay. Uh, so, so just some disclosures for today. So I am a speech language pathologist. I currently work with Matt Tuboro School District. Um, I have previously worked in several different hospitals in multiple different states. And um, I'm a member of the uh, Alaska Speech Language Hearing Association, also known as ACSHA. Um, I'm, an, I'm a member of the American Speech Language, Speech Language Hearing Association. which is our national organization. And for this year's uh, 2024 ASHA convention, which will be in Seattle, um, I'm on the committee, the topic chair, the topic committee for pediatric feeding disorders. Um, financial disclosures are, I have previously received compensation for presenting on feeding and swallowing disorders in the past. Okay, so for today, there's a lot um, that, we're, that we are going to cover. Um, so I will uh, um, just know that if at, down the road, if you have questions, um, my contact information will be available at the end and, and feel free to reach out. Uh, so for today, we're gonna define swallowing and feeding disorders. We're gonna discuss the signs and symptoms of swallowing and feeding disorders. We're going to identify the individuals who are at risk for swallowing and feeding disorders. We're going to discuss possible referrals to support individuals with swallowing and feeding disorders. We're going to review various food and drink consistencies. And we're going to talk about, talk about the parents and caregivers role in addressing swallowing and feeding skills and um, determining what parents can do to assist, parents or caregivers can do to assist these individuals. Okay, so I just wanna make sure to highlight, um, this is uh, Emily Homer. She is a retired speech language pathologist from um, Louisiana, and she wrote the book, Management of Swallowing and Feeding Disorders in Schools. And uh, portions of today's presentations um, come from Emily and her um, fantastic book. Um, I also would like to reference um, Michelle Dawson, uh, let's see. Oh, oh gosh. Oh, okay. There, hopefully you can see it. Um, so Michelle Dawson is, is also very big in the world of pediatric feeding disorders and dysphagia. She has a wonderful book that, uh, portions of today will also be touching upon, um, called chasing the swallow and, um, chasing the swallow truth, science and hope for pediatric feeding and swallowing disorders. So again, that's Michelle Dawson, D A. W S O N and um, this and many more um, items are in the references again at the end of the presentation. Okay. So what is a swallowing and a feeding disorder? Delays and or disorders in the development of eating and drinking skills. So this would include introducing food or drink into the mouth preparing the food, so food or drink in the oral phase of the swallow. So your oral cavity is, is your mouth, your tongue, your teeth, hard palate. So oral um, phase, um, and then transferring the food or the drink back to the pharyngeal phase of swallow. So when you actually get the swallow going, that would be the pharyngeal phase where you're transporting the food or drink down into the pharyngeal phase of the swallow. And um, then getting the food or the liquid from the mouth through the esophagus um, down to the stomach. So the uh, esophageal phase of swallow is once it enters into the esophagus and goes down into the stomach. 
Um, and we will cover this with um, some videos here in a minute. Um, and then also management of, sal of saliva and oral intake of medications is also taken into consideration when discussing swallowing and feeding disorders. Okay, so this is a um, the three stages of the swallowing. So if we cut our heads in half, this is what we all look like um, from the sides. So our lips are here in the front. You'll see this white bone, here's our teeth. The bone is our hard palate. And then if you can see our tongues are on the floor of our oral cavity. The screen is going to, let's just say it's guacamole, something we're going to swallow. So if you can see the roof of your mouth is that hard palate, uh, which is bone. And then if you can see it transitions into soft tissue. So that would be your soft palate. And also you can see at the base of our tongue, we all have a flap called our epiglottis. And our epiglottis um, is strictly cartilage. When we swallow and our our thyroid cartilage, our Adam's apple on the man, when you can feel that um, elevate up and then go back down, that is your epiglottis that is swinging down shut during, um, during your swallow. And it's closing off the pathway towards your larynx or your voice box. And also below your vocal cords is your trachea or your windpipe. So that is your epiglottis that tilts down to protect your airway. Also, while you are swallowing, your voice box and your vocal cords squeeze together to form another form of protection for um, ensuring that things don't go down the wrong way. And then when we're done swallowing, you'll see that our epiglottis comes back up into that uh, resting position. Our, our epiglottis is always elevated. The only time that it swings down shut is when we're in that act of swallowing. And this blue line is the, um, the airflow. So you can see here, the blue line, you can breathe in through your nose. It goes down into your larynx or your vocal cord, larynx or voice box, and down into your trachea or windpipe and keep following this down and it leads to your lungs, your left and right lobes. And, uh, okay, so let's get into some animation here. Oh, actually, here's where I'm gonna bear with me when I do a little, switch here. Okay. So here's some animation of what our swallow looks like. Oh, and uh, just to say, I um, just to let you know, I did um, buy the uh, copyrights for this video and the previous images that we're just looking at. Um, just knowing that, that this would be um, out in the world. So uh, I did buy those copyrights. Um, okay, so here is our animation for a normal swallow. Swallowing or deglutition is the process by which food passes from the mouth through the pharynx and into the esophagus. As simple as it might seem to healthy people, swallowing is actually a very complex action that requires an extremely precise coordination with breathing, since both of these processes share the same entrance the pharynx. Failure to coordinate would result in choking or pulmonary aspiration. Swallowing involves over 20 muscles of the mouth, throat, and esophagus, which are controlled by several cortical areas and by the swallowing centers in the brainstem. The brain communicates with the muscles through several cranial nerves. Swallowing consists of three phases. Oral or buccal phase. This is the voluntary part of swallowing. The food is moistened with saliva and chewed. Food bolus is formed and the tongue pushes it to the back of the throat, the pharynx. This process is under neural control of several areas of cerebral cortex, including the motor cortex. 
Pharyngeal phase starts with stimulation of tactile receptors in the oropharynx by the food bolus. The swallow reflex is initiated and is under involuntary neuromuscular control. The following actions are taken to ensure the passage of food or drink into the esophagus. The tongue blocks the oral cavity to prevent going back to the mouth. The soft palate blocks entry to the nasal cavity. The vocal folds close to protect the airway to the lungs. The larynx is pulled up with the epiglottis flipping over covering the entry to the trachea. This is the most important step since entry of food or drink into the lungs may potentially be life-threatening. The upper esophageal sphincter opens to allow passages to the esophagus. Esophageal phase. Food bolus is propelled down the esophagus by peristalsis, a wave of muscular contraction that pushes the bolus ahead of it. The larynx moves down back to the original position. All right. So you can see, just to highlight again, how our tongue pushes the food from the front to the back. The epiglottis swings down shut so that food transitions down into our esophagus. And then the bolus, sorry, the uh, epiglottis comes, um, swings back up. Um, and you also know, uh, should have noted the importance of, it's not just the muscles um, that need to coordinate over, t depending on which study you read, over 20 plus muscles are tied in with the actual act of swallowing to get the food transition from the mouth down to the stomach. But also you can see, obviously your brain is a um, huge part of your swallowing as well, because that's the one that's telling the muscles what to do. Um, so if anybody has any cognitive impairments for whatever reason, um, anoxia at birth, potentially related to, um, sorry, cerebral palsy, which would have been, um, anoxic episodes at birth, how that um, can impact their motor impairment, which can also impact the muscles of swallowing. Okay. And I would like to show this. So this is going to be a swallowing x-ray. So this is an x-ray that um, if somebody needs to know what's going on with their swallowing function, then they can go to a hospital with a speech language pathologist and a radiologist that can perform essentially a mini a mini movie that can um, play a series of swallows that this person is doing. Um, so the S speech language pathologist would be directing the swallowing X-ray to figure out what consistencies look um, best for, for an individual to be on, what uh, strategies, to, um, behavior strategies that might need to be implemented uh, to improve their swallowing safety. So um, I'm gonna have us take a look at this. So this is again, looking from the side. And this is this swallowing x-ray, uh, it's, it's known as a video fluoroscopic swallow study or VFSS, also known as a modified barium swallow study or MBSS. Again, swallowing x-ray. So this is a teaspoon of water, thin liquid water. And again, everything we're looking at is normal. You can see that was very fast paced, cup drink of water. Everything looks good, went down the right way. And actually, I'm gonna take a break and rewind here for a minute. I just, sorry, I should have highlighted some of this. Um, so if you can see right here, this hook in their pharyngeal area. So this is the epiglottis that is upright. 
and it will be swinging down shut when they are in the act of swallowing. Um, you can see the grayer area. That is the larynx, the voice box, and the trachea leading down to the lungs. Um, the epiglottis is actually sorry, uh, here's your epiglottis. Your esophagus is always shut. The only time your esophagus opens is when um, you're physically swallowing something. And uh, that's when this upper esophageal sphincter will open up, allow whatever's being swallowed to come through, pass through the upper esophageal sphincter. This upper esophageal sphincter or UES will close back up and then whatever's being swallowed will be pushed down with muscles um, known as esophageal peristalsis. Um, so that will be pushing the food that you're, or drink that it's being consumed or medication down to the stomach. So again, esophageal peristalsis. So this is all a series of muscular movements with messages being sent from the brain. This is a very complex act that, um, you don't really think about until you need to, but, um, okay. So again, uh, let's look at this again, teaspoon of water, thin liquid water. So keep an eye on the drink as it goes down, but also keep an eye on this area too. So you can keep an eye on that epiglottis swinging down shut and then coming back up and everything for the most part is clear after the first, maybe second swallow but nothing is going down the wrong way into the voice box, the larynx, or the um, trachea or the windpipe. So this is all normal that you're looking at. Again, teaspoon of water, pretty fast, goes down. Cup drink, thin liquid water, very fast. Lots of coordination to get that going with those consecutive drinks. Let's say that's a thicker drink. Uh, let's say that's uh, maybe some applesauce right there. Okay, a cracker. So this is probably a saltine or a graham cracker. Chewing it up very well, pushing it back. Nice and smooth transition down. Okay, so that was all the lateral view. So now we are looking head on. So the person is facing the camera. So this individual, again, everything's going is gonna be going down the right way. Um, but you'll see this is um, thin liquid water that is being swallowed down and um, they'll do a pan down here in a minute so you can see it dumping into the stomach. So, okay, drink going down. You can see it dumping into the stomach right there. Okay, oh, let's throw one of that. Just to see that again. Okay, sorry, I'm gonna go back to this beginning. It's just so fast. Okay, cup drink of water, looks good. Everything's going down good. You can see it's very fast, about half a second to a second to get the bolus down from the mouth down to the stomach. Chewing um, some kind of a solid, hard solid. And uh, when someone goes in for the swallowing x-ray, it has to be mixed. The food and the drink is mixed with barium, a white powder called barium. The barium is actually what shows up on the x-ray. Okay, so everything's going down nice and smooth here. And let's go over this one. Okay, so here we have Okay, so we're going to see a normal and then an abnormal swallow. So let me just kind of set this up. So what, again, we're going to look at um, a drink of thin liquids. So everything looks good when it when it's going to go down. So the person's um, epiglottis is right here. That hook that's going to swing down shut, close off the pathway to the voice box and the larynx. Like I mentioned, the um, upper esophageal sphincter is always closed. It only opens when something is being um, swallowed and then it closes back up. Um, so this is normal.
Okay, so food enters into the esophagus and not into the trachea. So nice and smooth, everything went down good. Um, no significant residue. There's no significant residue um, after the swallow. So things are clear. What I want you to notice about this one that I'm about to show you. So this is an abnormal swallow. Again, it's going to be a drink of thin lipid. But what I want you to notice is, um, oh, by the way, this person has um, had some dental work. So the darker, um, those darker um, circles, those are cavities. Um, but anyway, um, so this person takes a drink. What I want you to notice is here's their epiglottis, but what's going to happen is this drink is going to basically waterfall and cascade down from their tongue into this pocket called the vallecula, cascade further down into, there's pockets down here you can't really see, but it's called the piriform sinuses. And then unfortunately these piriform sinuses are going to overflow and then the drink's going to spill over into their larynx or their voice box. And then once it goes below their vocal cords into their trachea or their windpipe. That's that's known as aspiration. So let's again. This is this is what we do not want. This is what we are avoiding. See how it's starting to waterfall down. So down into the molecular, down to the piriforms, overflows into the voice box. Here's the vocal cords. And then you can see this is in their uh, windpipe or their trachea. So this is headed to the lungs. Now, what you might also notice is that this person is not coughing at all. Um, this is probably an elderly person that came in with aspiration pneumonia. But um, you and I, if we were to take a drink and, you know, this, all, this happens to all of us, we take a drink, it goes down the wrong way. But we have the reflect uh, reflex to give a really strong cough. And this person does not have that reflex to, to cough. And that, when you do not have that sensation to cough after you have an aspiration episode, then that is called silent aspiration. And that is, aspiration is not good to begin with, but silent aspiration is even more dangerous because you have no sensation that something a foreign body went down into your lungs. So uh, we'll just watch that one more time. So this is what we don't want. So this is thin liquid. So it's basically water falling down and cascading down into the wrong direction. So, um, and an unfortunate consequence of drinks going down into um, the wrong direction into our lungs is, um, like I said, it's pneumonia, but more specifically aspiration pneumonia. Um, and it's, it's the drink. It's not good when you have a foreign body that is entering into your lungs, your lungs will actually reabsorb that liquid, but it's the bacteria from the mouth that gets carried with a drink. And that is what grows into aspiration pneumonia is the um, bac oral bacteria. So um, just in general, if somebody has are, is at risk for things to go down um, the wrong way, drinks to go down the wrong way, then the cleaner their mouth is, the better. Okay, let's get out of this. Go back to our slides. Okay. Just moving some things over. Okay. So hopefully everybody feels fairly comfortable with um, an anatomy of swallowing. Uh, okay. So um, when is it dysphagia or a swallowing disorder? So we talked about the oral phase of the swallow. So when um, an individual, I, I said a student, this actually um, should have said that, should say an individual, but I've done this presentation for um, 
uh, school staff. So apologies if you're seeing students sometimes. Um, okay, so the oral phase is when an individual cannot chew food adequately to break it down and form a bolus. So the bolus is what is actually being swallowed. Um, when you cannot uh, chew the food adequately to break it down to form a bolus, which can be safely swallowed. So that would be an impact to your oral phase of swallowing. Um, a pharyngeal phase concern, a pharyngeal, a, a form of dysphagia for the pharyngeal phase is when um, structurally there's a problem that interferes with the swallowing mechanism to protect the airway or with food or drink going directly um, when, sorry, let me say that again. When structurally there is a problem that interferes with the swallowing mechanism protecting the airway or with food or liquid going um, directly into the esophagus. So um, we want to make sure everything does go down into the esophagus. And if it's going down the wrong way, um, compromising the airway, um, that is a pharyngeal phase issue. Um, esophageal phase, um, the food is not transferred through the UES, the upper esophageal sphincter, um, and pushed through the esophagus to the stomach. So if you remember, I mentioned um, esophageal peristalsis is the series of muscular um, movement that pushes that food from the top of the um, esophagus, upper esophageal sphincter, all the way down to the uh, lower esophageal sphincter, which dumps, um, which is just above the stomach. Okay, so so that that would be a swallowing disorder. So now, what is it, when is it a feeding disorder? Um, when children need special equipment, uh, when they need to be uh, positioned appropriately, um, or they need to have food modified in order to safely eat their meals. When they have a feeding disorder, it is when they would have a feeding disorder. Um, and when children have difficulty using utensils during meal times. Um, when uh, children have behaviors or sensory concerns that result in a limitation of the foods that they eat. Um, think of your picky eaters, um, which that would also fall under, um, I mentioned pediatric feeding disorders. Um, when children impulsively take bites in rapid succession and overstuff their mouth, or they pocket food in their cheeks before swallowing. That's a, that is a, also a feeding disorder. So you obviously have some overlap between um, feeding and swallowing. Um, so you could have um, both or you could have, uh, you know, a feeding um, disorder could in itself be just one component of difficulties with um, eating and drinking. Like uh, I'd mentioned picky eating. Um, picky eating would not necessarily be a form of dysphagia, um, swallowing difficulty. So, okay. Um, so who is at risk for dysphagia? Um, and dysphagia is the medical term for um, swallowing disorders. So swallowing disorders occur in all age groups and can occur as a result of a variety of congenital abnormalities, structural damage and neurological disease or disorders. So, so think of, uh, you know, the individuals in your lives, not necessarily the one that you're primarily thinking of now, but just other individuals that you have come across in your, um, just your, your, your walk of life. Um, so who is at risk for uh, feeding and swallowing disorder? So individuals that have developmental disabilities, individuals that have neurological disorders such as cerebral palsy, uh, PDD, pervasive developmental disorder, uh, TBI, traumatic brain injury. Um, so we talked about the importance of the brain in terms of um, getting those messages to all the musculature um, and the neuroanatomy for the complex um, swallowing that system that needs to happen. Um, so uh, individuals with cerebral palsy, 90% of individuals with cerebral palsy do have some form of dysphagia or swallowing difficulty. Um, genetic syndromes. So think of um, your um, individuals with 
chromosome deletion or um, I have a niece that uh, has Down syndrome. So I know um, her journey has been um, not an easy one for my sister um, as she's kind of helped her transition from only wanting to be on puree foods to um, being able to um, consume and tolerate being on uh, regular foods than liquids. Uh, structural abnormalities. Um, so this could be um, a variety of things. So um, in the last picture, structural abnormality, you'll, you see the individual there with the cleft lip and palate. So that would be a, a structural abnormality of their, um, their lip and their hard palate. So that would, of course, impact their swallowing, their ability to form that lip seal and to contain the um, bolus in the oral cavity. Um, another structural abnormality that um, comes to mind is um, I've worked with individuals that have had um, what's called esophageal tresia. So when they were born, their esophagus never fully formed um, to connect from the top of their upper esophageal sphincter down to their um, stomach. So that, that individual, um, once the Physicians realized, you know, that they didn't have a fully functioning esophagus. Um, that individual had multiple surgeries to essentially create one. But that uh, these individuals um, don't have the um, esophageal peristalsis that we had talked about. So that is an example of structural abnormality and. Um, uh, sensory issues could be those picky eating. Um, those picky eaters that we talked about. Um, behavioral factors uh, could be for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, some people have that, um, you know, an, an, an idea that comes to mind is uh, um, uh, individuals that have some kind of brain abnormality, um, maybe a traumatic brain injury, you know, that suddenly now they just feel like they have to impulsively eat as quick as they can, or they'll um, consume their foods and they'll just kind of hold it in their mouth. So um, that's a, a behavioral factor. Um, complex medical conditions, of course, can be a component of a uh, difficulty with uh, feeding and swallowing. Autism, um, cognitive deficits, uh, students that, sorry, again, that student, um, individuals taking certain medications, diuretics, um, antihypertensive and antidepressants can also impact swallowing. Some medications are also a factor, um, that could impact swallowing. Okay. Um, so who and what of swallowing and feeding? So why are we concerned about how a child eats? Uh, what can happen if a child is not fed correctly? How do I know if a child is not being fed correctly. And um, of course, safety is always needs to be the um, first consideration. So uh, safety concerns that may impact a child's ability to learn um, if they're undernourished or they're dehydrated, if they're choking or if they have aspiration and pneumonia. Um, so again, I mentioned we're we're talking about I've I've done this um, presentation for a lot of school staff, um, but of course this could be for a child's ability to just be a you know living life if they're undernourished, dehydrated, choking, aspiration, pneumonia. Of course, that's all going to impact their ability to function. Um, okay, so signs and symptoms of. Um, being uh, under nutrition, if they're tired or lethargic, irritable, anxious and disoriented, uh, if they bruise easily, diarrhea or rashes could also be symptomatic of not um, having enough nutrition. And uh, dehydration. So if individuals have a lot of thirst, if you notice that their mouth is very dry and sticky, um, if they have decreased urine output, um, when they try to cry, if they don't have a lot of tears or very few tears, um, or if they may be sleepy, complaining of a headache, dizziness, or lightheadedness. So again, that would be concerns with, you know, 
not just dehydration, but are there concerns for failure to thrive, you know, consuming enough uh, nutrition for the body to function? Uh, okay, so red flags, what could be reported by um, parents or caregivers um, and what we need to be on, on the lookout for, for um, concerning behaviors with feeding and swallowing. So if somebody has repeated respiratory infections, if like we had just talked about, if drinks are going down the wrong way towards the lungs, then that's gonna impact their breathing. And we talked about pneumonia, but sometimes these respiratory illnesses like bronchitis might actually be like little trace amounts of aspiration that's going on um, versus those, uh, you saw that in that video, uh, quite a bit of um, aspiration that was going on. But um, if you, even if, if someone has any kind of respiratory illness and they have those different um, risk factors that we had talk, talked about of, um, you know, individuals that would be at higher risk for um, feeding or swallowing difficulties. You know, if they're starting to develop respiratory illnesses, then we always need to have in the back of our head if there's the concern that they're aspirating or things going down the wrong way. Um, if someone has had, um, like we said, history of recurrent pneumonias, um, if they're losing weight, we talked about failure to thrive. Um, if they're having difficulty chewing, uh, coughing, choking during or after the swallow. So if something's not going down the right way and then suddenly they're starting to cough, that, again, that could all be problematic. Um, maintaining an open mouth posture if they have excessive drooling. So drooling, um, when someone's when someone has a lot of drooling, um, their saliva is basically pooling up in their oral cavity because they're not automatically triggering that reflexive swallow to clear that saliva, which we do without even thinking. So um, that could be uh, concerning. Um, if they're starting to refuse food, um, it could be for a variety of reasons. Um, one thought that comes to mind if if they're good with food, you know, or, uh, you know, if they're good with food for a particular stretch and then suddenly they're refusing, well, that actually could be something going on with their, um, their GI tract, their gastrointestinal tract. So maybe they're constipated or maybe there's something going on in their gut. So, um, there's, you know, detective work that needs to be done. Um, if they're starting to take a long, a much longer time um, for feeding um, or just a long time in general, uh, you don't want to have excessive feeding times because then your um, individuals are going to be burning more calories than they're taking in or at least not um, building up the um, caloric intake that they would if they didn't have the, um, you know, that prolonged feeding. Um Poor oral motor functioning. So anytime that somebody doesn't have um, good coordination with their tongue, um, their lips, their jaw, um, I'm going to go back to your tongue. Your tongue is a huge part, a huge part of your swallowing. So if you're noticing somebody that doesn't have good oral motor functioning, so um, their speech sounds distorted, um, they're swallowing, just their chewing looks off. That's that's all risk factors that um, could be very problematic. Uh, nasal regurgitation, that is when um, you take a drink and the drink comes out your nose. So that is a failure of your soft palate musculature. Um, so that there's something going on if, if you've got uh, drinks coming out um, your nose when you uh, go to swallow. Uh, wet or gurgle voice um, or a wet gurgle sound after a meal. So if um, somebody takes a drink and it goes down the wrong way, then that moisture that's kind of laying on top of the vocal cords, that's all um, an indication that something went down the wrong way. So I wish I could replicate it. I, at the times that I've tried, I'll, I'll just um, cough my head off. Um, but essentially if you hear that wet gurgle quality um, after somebody takes a drink, then, then that could be, um, 
an indication that they've had drinks that are at least going into their voice box um, with the risk of it um, potentially going down further into their trachea, into their windpipe, potentially towards their lungs. Um, so that's something we want to um, make sure that we um, address. Um, and then somebody, uh, difficulty initiating a swallow. So someone who you have the food in your mouth and it's just really slow and laborious to get that, that pharyngeal swallow triggered, that could be a problem too. So, okay. Um, so there was a, uh, there was a very good story and, um, the ASHA leader is our, our monthly, um, for speech language pathologists and audiologists, this is our, our monthly magazine. So back in November, 2019, there was a really well done story in the ASHA leader about uh, choking and just some things that really stand out from this article. So on a very sad um, fact, but roughly one child dies in the United States every five days from choking on food. Um, and then you can see here, uh, there's different food items and non-food items that are most likely to cause choking. So um, I'm going to just kind of highlight some of the things that are, you know, a lot of, a lot of times kids will have um, maybe a piece of hard candy. So something that's round and slippery, um, hot dogs, grapes, those um, cylindrical um, items can really be a problem. Um, so I'm going to have you just kind of review that and I'm going to take a quick drink off camera here for a moment. So you'll see obviously quite a bit of things that if a child puts it in their mouth, um, and they swallow it, it could be quite a problem. Um, so these are all things to be leery of when we're um, having individuals um, that we want to make sure we're decreasing their risk for choking. Okay, um, so this is a very, another interesting statistic. So one in 37 young children have a pediatric feeding disorder. So this statistic comes from a wonderful organization called Feeding Matters. We will discuss that here coming up in a little bit. Um, but I, I want to highlight here. So this is one in 323 children have cerebral palsy. One in 54 children have autism. One in 37 young children have pediatric feeding disorder. And again, that could be not just individuals that have um, like actual difficulty with the, you know, the physical act of swallowing, but, um, you know, like we had talked about those um, really picky eaters and that, you know, more of like the sensory um, component. Anyway, uh, so, Okay, so now for parents and caregivers, my child has red flags for feeding and swallowing issues. How do I address this and who can help? Okay, so some possible referrals. You're obviously gonna always need to start with your pediatrician. So swallowing and feeding disorders are addressed using a team approach ideally. So intervention teams may look different depending on your child's medical diagnosis and the signs and symptoms of their uh, difficulties. So, um, so a non-school-based speech language pathologist, so a private speech language pathologist, um, or also or one that is working in the medical setting that might be working at a hospital. Um, anyway, so a non-school-based speech language pathologist can evaluate and treat pediatric feeding and or swallowing disorders. Um, they can refer for further diagnostic and instrumental evaluations, such as a swallowing x-ray we talked about. Uh, an otolaryngologist, also known as an ear, nose, throat doctor, um, if there's problems with a child's ears, their nose, their throat, that's who we're going to want to see. 
Um, if there's concerns about the nervous system, we want the neurologist involved. Um, if we do have concerns that things are going down the wrong way or are at risk for things to go down the wrong way towards the lungs, then absolutely a pulmonologist should be um, on this child's um, team. Um, a GI doctor or a gastroenterologist would be the one that would really help support um, concerns that might come up with the digestion system. So I I had mentioned um, constipation uh, earlier, how that could be a problem. Um, or some, some individuals just have a slow dumping of the the food or the drink that's in the stomach for it to transition down into the intestines to also continue that digestion process. That would be something we want to have the gastroenterologist or the GI doctor involved with. Um, a registered dietitian can help us with our nutrition needs. And I'm realizing nutrition is wrong. It's spelled wrong there. So <laughs> nutrition, not nutrient. Uh, okay, so registered dietitian can help us with our nutrition needs. Um, if there's concerns with the heart, of course, the cardiologist should be involved. Um, some individuals actually you might not think about this, but um, allergies might come into play. Uh, there's actually a, a lot of individuals that um, are allergic to dairy and how problematic that can be. Um, or allergies that might um, get created from um, sensitivity within the esophagus. Um, well, again, that would, the, and you would have some overlap, of course, when you have, um, you know, individuals on these teams, you've got overlap as well, but allergies should, um, also potentially might need to be uh, taken into consideration. Um, Psychologists or psychiatrists would help deal with the psychosocial um, concerns that come up. So um, our kids that have really severe picky eating, um, they might need to be um, have a psychologist or a psychiatrist as a component to um, figuring out why. Why are they such picky eaters? Is it is it a GI issue um, or is there some kind of a behavioral control thing? Um, anyway, so again, they might need to be a referral. Occupational therapists um, can help us um, figure out sensory issues and find motor issues. The physical therapist, of course, can help us address um, gross motor issues and positioning. Um, and I always want to make sure I highlight that uh, individuals that are going to be, um, for setting them up for um, safe swallowing, um, good positioning is very important. So kids that are coming to mind that uh, potentially are in chairs and their legs are dangling. Um, if you have a child that's got uh, feeding and swallowing issues, you want to make sure their feet are supported so that there's some kind of, if they're sitting in a chair, uh, they have some kind of a foot rest or a foot stool to support their feet. Um, they you do not want feet dangling when, um, when they are eating, they need to have, um, that, uh, nice foot rest to help support their, um, the whole positioning component. Okay. Um, Dysphagia, diets and foods. Uh, so when we're talking about foods, how well does your child chew their foods? Are they good at chewing their foods? Are they, do they have one good chew? Then they push their food to the middle of their mouth and then it becomes like a mashing of their tongue against the roof of their mouth. Um, are they able to get foods to go from side to side? And back, so um, do they have a rotary chew or is it more like um, like a chomp chew? Um, but essentially, uh, how, how well somebody is able to chew their foods is really going to dictate the consistencies that they will be safe on. Um, so foods that are um, pureed, um, minced 
or minced foods, minced and moist foods, um, finely chopped foods. Um, those are foods that don't really require a lot of chewing. Um, but then again, as you're consuming more foods that do need to be chewed, you need to make sure that your mastication skills are um, intact. So um, soft and bite-sized foods are foods that need to be chewed, but are easier to break up in the mouth for swallowing. Um, and then regular foods are foods that require much chewing, including hard, crunchy foods, more complex foods. Um, and I'm going to show you this um, IDDSI.org um, framework. So that's International Dysphagia Diet Standardization Initiative. I'll show you that here in a minute. Uh, but I just want to reference. So think of... Um, Oh gosh, think of the the fruit snacks that our kids like to eat. Um, those are that's a pretty complex food. That's a lot of uh chewing that needs to take place because they're not only do they have to like chew and break up that gummy consistency, but they have to also make sure that it doesn't wad up um and that when they go to swallow it, it's not a big gummy wad. So um that's just you know something that comes to mind. Um you know, uh, breads, those can be pretty difficult too. things that are dry. Um, and then doughy that can be, um, require a lot of, um, mastication skills, um, good chewing skills. Uh, let's right here. Okay. So right here, this is an image from, um, NC framework. So internet, again, international dysphagia diet standardization initiative. So uh, speech language pathologists and dietitians, our, our national organizations, going back to 2019, um, our national organizations have recommended that we try to um, write up food and drink consistencies according to IDSI levels. So uh, what I want you to notice here for the foods, you'll see uh, the green is the puree, so a level four. And then as you work your way up to level five, level six, level seven, how this is more and more um, chewing that needs to take place. So, you know, a, a regular food consistency would be a hamburger or um, potato chips, um, oranges, things that are, um, you know, fibrous like that, um, pineapple. Um, anyway, but essentially, uh, if you hear something along these lines of pureed foods, minced and moist, soft and bite size, uh, foods that are easy to chew, but regular, uh, these, these are all from the IDSI framework. And then moving over, you'll see the drinks here. So, um, most of us are drinking thin liquids. So a level zero, so nothing is, uh, thickened. But then as we move up from level zero to one to two to three, then we're progressively getting more and more thick. And just so people understand the purpose behind um, thickened drinks is um, essentially what thickeners do is they slow down the speed of the drink. So an individual that takes a drink, uh, if you saw the... Um, if you remember the swallowing x-ray that we looked at, that individual that took the drink of the water and it basically like waterfalled down over, you know, overflowed from their piriform sinuses and then went down into their, um, aspirated into their lungs. You know, that person might've done better if they had their drinks thickened. So, and again, that's what those swallowing x-rays are also helpful for if someone's not safe on thin liquids, okay, well, what consistency of drinks are they, are they, um, safe on? Um, so, um, basically you're slowing down the speed of the drink because the hardest thing to swallow is thin liquids. Look at how fast they wrote, they go down your throat. Um, so there's different types of thickener out there. Uh, there's, um, a very common one is called um, Simply Thick, although there's other thickeners out there as well. Um, gel, gel, 
gel. There's other there's other gel uh, gel based thickeners, not just simply thick. Gel thick. I'm so sorry. And then um, I know like a, a thicket is um, what is commonly um, it, sold in the stores, and that's more of a cornstarch based um, thickener product. But anyway, uh, if someone has to be on thick and liquids, usually uh, the colder and the sweeter they are, they're usually a little bit more palatable. Um, and, uh, but just know that somebody that's, um, uh, that has to be on thick and liquids, um, don't leave ice in their drink because the ice will melt and it will thin, thin down the thickener. So anyway, okay. Um, so this whole slide right here could be I mean, that's a whole, that's a whole presentation right there, but, um, just to kind of introduce it. Okay. So then, um, dysphagia diets. Um, so for liquid, so how coordinated is your child swallow? Um, and like I mentioned, regular drinks are the hardest thing to swallow. So thin liquid, regular drinks would typically someone, um, that has a normal swallow should be able to tolerate that. But if the, if drinks are going down the wrong way and they don't have the cognition to do like a positioning, like a side movement or a chin tuck for them to, um, manipulate their head positioning. Um, and it, if they do need to be on those thickened liquids, then again, it's how far down do you need to go? Do they need to be on, um, mildly thick also known as nectar thick, which it, like I mentioned is a slight thickness to it. Um, moving down that thickness scale, um, previously um, called honey thick, but now called moderately thick. Again, using the um, IDC International Dysphagia Diet um, terms. Um, so moderately thick is when, if you basically have a thickened and then you kind of scoop the drink and then you drizzle it from the spoon, and it leaves a trail on the surface of the drink, that would be an example of honey thick. And then something that's extremely thick or spoon thick is the equivalent of like an applesauce or a pudding. Um, so again, that's all from the um, IDC framework. So that was this. So we talked about, most of us are on uh, th drinking thin liquids level zero, but we do have individuals that aren't safe on these thin liquids and need to be on thickened drinks. And it's just a matter of, okay, well, what level of thickness do they need to be at? Okay. Um, cultural considerations. Uh, many, culture, many cultures have um, strong beliefs about foods that can or cannot be eaten. Um, how foods are prepared and how foods are presented. Uh, families should speak with their service providers, such as a speech language pathologist, um, regarding foods and drinks that are culturally important to the families that they would like their child to be able to eat or drink. So um, your speech language pathologist um, would definitely um, help to figure out a way to um, make sure to have your um, child's foods and drinks be um, a component of their um, oral intake if, if it needs to be modified. The, your speech language pathologist or service providers will um, ideally be able to work with you on that. Uh, okay, so um, if you get a chance to take a pause and um, for grabbing some items, but essentially what I would like for people to do is um, get a drink and um, just whatever you wanna take, um, water, well, we'll just say water. Um, so from a cup, I want you to take a regular sip. So whatever feels like regular, normal drink to you. Okay, now take, after you've done that, now I want you to take a small sip. And I also want you to do the same with a straw. I want you to take a drink with a straw, just like a single sip versus multiple sips. So what I want you to realize is, you know, just kind of be aware of like how much you're actually consuming and how quickly you're consuming it when you're um, drinking in these different uh, methods, a small sip of a thin liquid, uh, a regular sip, um, 
How fast does a drink go to the back of your mouth when you're drinking from a straw? And especially someone who does not have good um, oral uh, motor coordination. So we were talking about how important the um, coordination of your tongue is, you know, how that could be a problematic with drinking from a straw because um, the speed of the drink comes in uh, much faster with a straw because you're, you know, you've got that speed coming in. Well, now you, but your tongue better be able to coordinate that drink so that it doesn't spill over until you're ready to swallow. Um, anyway, just some things to kind of be aware of for that. Um, for the foods, um, if you get a chance, it'd be nice for you to take a bite of something smooth like applesauce, pudding, or yogurt. And I want you to just notice how obviously you don't need to do any chewing for that, but how, you know, you're just moving that cohesive bolus um, back and forth um, from side to side in your mouth. Um, okay. So then again, starting to be aware of the importance of chewing and of, um, the mastication skills. So find some kind of a soft solid, um, you know, something like that, that comes to mind for me is, uh, like one of those fruit bars, those Nutrigain bars. Um, you know, I, I, um, when I think of a soft salad, I usually think of that. So what I want you to notice is how much you need to chew before you, um, how much you need to chew a bite of that before you go to swallow. Um, now take a small bite of that soft salad and try to chew it without using your teeth. Okay. So, um, I'm actually going to have you, um, I know I mentioned the, uh, Nutrigain bar, but I'm going to actually, um, have you, if you can take a corner of a piece of um, bread, white bread would be great if you have it. Um, but basically what you're doing is you're tearing off a piece and I want you to try to chew without using your teeth. So essentially what you're doing is you're mashing the bread against from your tongue, you're mashing it against the roof of your mouth. So for some individuals that can't get that chewing pattern to go from side to side to side, that tongue mashing is their chewing. Okay, so, well, if that's their chewing, then we need to make sure they're on um, foods that can break up pretty easily with that um, tongue mashing. Um, and hopefully you're realizing that um, a dry, small piece of bread is not so easy to mash up um, and then try to swallow. Um, so whenever I have a workshop, that's usually one of the um, definite things I have them people do is, uh, you know, that exercise is try chewing without using your teeth um, with a soft doughy consistency. Uh, okay, so now take a bite of something hard and crunchy and notice how much you need to chew before you swallow. So just being keenly aware of the importance of, of not just your tongue moving from side to side, but also the importance of your teeth. Um, you know, if an individual doesn't have their molars, then that could be the, your, you know, your larger teeth there in the back of your mouth, but how that could be, um, that could be a, a concern. Um, but basically we wanna make sure that um, someone that's gonna be eating solid foods, whether it's a soft salad or a hard, crunchy, fibrous, doughy consistency, there's a lot of chewing. So it's not, it's it's a lot to take, to think about, you know, what's, if, if individual has hard time chewing, well, how, how are we gonna modify to make them to be able to safely um, consume their foods. Um, okay, let's see. Are you feeling like you need to take a drink as you've got this uh, wad in your mouth? Um, is, is it anything feeling like it's stuck in your throat? So um, if you take a, uh, if you swallow something that's dry and you kind of feel like uh, you've got something stuck, then it could be stuck in that pocket that I mentioned earlier, the molecule, and that's what it, um, a good uh, liquid wash, a good drink um, will be helpful to help, you know, basically push it, push the drink, sorry, push the bolus down into your, um, 
down into your stomach. Okay. Okay. So organizations um, for caregiver empowerment, all related to um, feeding and swaddling. So I mentioned Feeding Matters um, earlier. So this is a really great organization um, that has been uh, very active since uh, 2006. And um, it's the first organization in the world uniting the concerns of families with the field's leading advocates, experts, and allied healthcare professionals to improve the system of care for pediatric feeding disorders through advocacy, education, support, and research. So um, Feeding Matters is um, one of the main reasons why we now have a new ICD-10 code for pediatric feeding disorders. It's because of the advocacy specifically behind this organization. Um, and that has made a huge ripple effect. Um, so in terms of addressing um, pediatric feeding disorders um, and getting better care for these individuals. Um, and just so you know, Feeding Matters has a yearly, um, they have a wonderful um, website that you can see here, but also they have a great conference every year. So um, very interactive um, website. I highly recommend um, anybody that is uh, watching this video that uh, regardless of parent, caregiver, um, service provider, physician, it's please check out this organization. It's 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 because of them that um, you know more people are aware of this uh, very critical need to address. Uh, okay, uh, the dysphagia outreach project. Uh, the mission of the Dysphagia Outreach Project is to provide meaningful assistance to individuals affected by dysphagia. Um, they have a food bank of dysphagia supplies, um, education. Um, they have a dysphagia, 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 tomato, tomato, um, dysphagia support group. So again, that's a dysphagia outreach project. The National Foundation of Swallowing Disorders and their commitment is to provide patient hope and improve quality of life for those suffering from all types of swallowing disorders by enhancing direct patient support, education, research, and raising public professional and governmental awareness. Our mission, their mission, is to advance the prevention and treatment of swallowing disorders in our lifetime. So again, that's the National Foundation of Swallowing Disorders. And then locally, Alaskan organizations that support um, our individuals with disability, Stone Soup Group, Hope Community Resources, and the Ark of Anchorage. So I'm sure many of you are already familiar with these wonderful organizations. Okay, so Parent caregivers role with swallowing and feeding. Uh, to receive training and implement the recommended diet modifications. To work with medical staff to ensure that the child is receiving enough nutrition and hydration for what his or her body needs. Uh, pursuing medical attention if, the if your child is demonstrating a change in condition, such as signs and symptoms of difficulty with eating and drinking to share knowledge of feeding habits, food preferences, and mealtime environment with service providers and school staff. And uh, please get CPR, please get trained in CPR. Uh, it, it's so important. Um, get trained in CPR for you and then please encourage um, family and fellow caregivers to also get trained um, anyone working with individuals that are at increased risk for feeding and swallowing disorder should be trained in uh, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, CPR. Um, and training should include the foreign body airway obstruction removal, also known as a Heimlich maneuver. So just an FYI, the Heimlich maneuver, I'm sorry, the Heimlich family, um, they copyrighted um, 
that term um, Heimlich maneuver. So that's why uh, different organizations are calling them abdominal thrusts or um, foreign body airway obstruction removal. It's 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 quite a mouthful, but anyway. Oh, did I not skip that? Okay, sorry about that. This is the slide that I just was reading. Uh, so please, like I had mentioned, um, get trained in um, CPR. Very important. Okay. Um, collaboration, the most important thing to help your child to obtain enough nutrition and hydration. Collaborate with your medical staff and service providers for the goal of eating and drinking safely at home. Collaborate on education and training you need or additional supports that you need to keep your child safe. It comes down to working together. So parents and caregivers are essential team members. If you are not sure what to do, please talk to your pediatrician. If you see something that you're concerned about, please talk with your pediatrician. If you have an idea of something that might work well for your child, talk to your pediatrician. If you disagree with what is being recommended, please talk to your pediatrician. And if you love what is being recommended at your next office visit, please talk to your pediatrician. Okay, so again, my name is Mary Dewar. I'm a speech language pathologist. I am local here in uh, Wasilla, Alaska. Um, my email is mpdooher. And it, yes, it is at email.com, not Gmail. Um, this, this email goes back years and years, but it is um, mpdoer at email.com. Um, so I very much appreciate uh, the time that, um, that you gave me today. And um, just to show you some references, um, everything that I went over here um, comes from some websites and different books and articles. So lots of good material here. And okay, that is officially it. And um, I love what I do. And I really would love to help as much as I can with, um, you know, educating more if needed. Um, any follow up questions? Uh, I'm going to stop my sharing. Okay. All right, so thank you so much for your time and um, yes, good luck. <laughs>